as we get ready to welcome in the Friday Five with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. Bill, I understand we have a listener in South Carolina. Oh, we certainly do. He's a loyal listener. Just to hear you uh, with your uh, insight. Well, I started to say rant. I decided that was not the right word. So your insight. <laughs> you know. Even when he rants, it's he, insightful. He, that's it's very insightful. That's exactly right. I don't hear Rob rants like he used to. I think he's mellowing. He's, you know, uh, they say that with age. Yeah. You, you mellow. And you have reached that mellowing age. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a birthday at the end of the month. Oh, happy birthday. Not there yet. Yeah. Don't, don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> You can't assume anything. <laughs> you cannot assume anything. You can't exactly assume right. anything, man. you, you got to be careful. <laughs> well, uh, Bill, as you pointed out uh, earlier, uh, the Friday Five has some uh, uh, one new fella mm-hmm. involved in it today uh, and one who has uh, been on the program occasionally mm-hmm. in the past. The, the question was, would I do intros today, being as that it was not the standard five-man crew? And there is a cry and plea from the readership i'm straight rob, in my please. ears trying to hear that <laughs> crying and, and, and plea. They're, they're saying rob if you don't do the intros we're not going to listen we're turning off we're going home yeah uh larry you might want to put your headphones on so you can hear joe for ready by the way okay. joe you are there correct i am here all right and we go a little something like this hit it all right here we go larry schultz you're up first the gap that was growing has halted its widen now that Trump shares classified document issues with President Joe Biden. <laughs> yep, Trump and Joe Biden share something in common for sure. How much will be up to newly appointed special prosecutor Robert Hewer? This special investigation could take from now until December. But when it's over, Larry Schultz, will Joe Biden remember? <laughs> it's great to be here. He will remember just fine. <laughs> I can't wait till Trump can testify to all the things he suddenly doesn't remember. <laughs> that would be the longest retort ever listed on the program for intros, by the way. <laughs> Back in the primary election, he created a stir in his own party by challenging the incumbent, Delegate John Hardy. He made his decision and ran on a whim. And that special day, 312 people voted for him. But John Hardy won, and by a lot to be clear, and that's why Alonzo Perry is our next panelist here. <laughs> Alonzo, good morning to you. I had, I had a little flow to it. Did you like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I worked yeah. on that special for you. <laughs> <laughs> Once when I texted, he was in South Dakota hunting the great white buffalo. I thought, is this guy Ted Nugent, a rock and roller we know? Another time I texted him, he was in Maine hunting bear. I thought, that's a long way to go to give Yogi a scare. Today, I'm finally successful, getting Chris Anders to debate with us all. Thank you, said the card I got. Signed, the animals, both large and small. (laughs) (laughs) My wife's the dangerous one, so. (laughs) Good morning, Mr. Anders. Good morning. He listened Wednesday night to the governor's speech and thought the 50% tax cut proposal was a bit of a reach. Surplus is built on severance taxes and inflation-backed money. Our surpluses that disappear so fast it ain't funny. But I must wonder why he's really against these tax cuts so great. It's because Joe Ferretti already done moved right out of this state. (laughs) (laughs) Morning, Joe. Let the record reflect I'm still paying West Virginia taxes. (laughs) <laughs> the record is reflected, and might I say, your retort was much shorter than Larry's. <laughs> and more meaningful. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Alex Mooney declared Joe Manchin he'd beat, causing Riley Moore to decide he'd like Alex's old seat. While Justice turned out his seats open late, pursued by more Capito, and now Mac Warner, the Secretary of State. All the while, Patrick Morrissey was warning not to settle for second best as J.B. McCuskey sat silent and thought, surely you jest. There's a lot going on. What's real and what's fake? Well, I've got a guy, and since he does make, stay tuned to the show and don't dare change that channel because Bill Stubblefield's got a life sentence on the Friday show panel. (laughs) 
I wonder where that was going, Rob. <laughs> I was thinking, it was going on for a while. I knew, I knew it was my turn, but I couldn't. I was having trouble sorting things out. Yeah, how's he going to get from Mooney to Stumblefield? <laughs> Probably the big question. All right, we start with our leadoff hitter each week. His name is Joe Ferretti. Torture up. Let, let me compliment you. That was an inspired effort. Uh, You're welcome. Since I do pay, <laughs> I do it for love. Taxes, <laughs> since I do pay West Virginia taxes, I got a, a dog in this fight, and I wanted to talk a little bit about PEIA. Uh, Rob, just give me 60 seconds here just to throw out uh, uh, some issue and facts to frame the issue. I Joe, say. I got 15 minutes and 15 seconds. Take all the time you want. <laughs> all right, man. Well, look, we have in West Virginia 230,000 enrollees in PEIA. I have to imagine that uh, a lot of listeners are probably enrolled with PEIA, and, and these issues concern them as well. A little bit, uh, just so you know about PEIA and, and how we got to the point where it's running in the red significantly uh, to the tune of over $100 million just this, this past year. Uh, your deductible, if you're with PEIA, is $950. If you buy your insurance out there on the market at the ACA or you're in a small group plan with your employer, average deductible is $7,500. Out-of-pocket maximum for PEIA is $5,500. Again, an ACA policy or a small group policy with your employer, the average is $14,000 out-of-pocket max. Why, are, why is PEA running in the red? Well, Number one, it's not a regular insurance company. It sets its rates based upon the income of the state employee. And if that state employee includes their spouse, which they can on a PEIA policy, the spouse's income is not included in terms of setting the rates for the insurance coverage. Reimbursement rates. Uh, PEIA, as we know, is having a real problem with that, which is why the Wheeling Hospital has declined to take PEIA coverage as of July of this year. Other hospitals may follow suit. And employee premiums by design in West Virginia have only increased at a rate of about 1% per year on average, and they've been relatively flat the past three or four years. And finally, while we know PEIA covers public employees, there are 650 non-state agencies whose employees participate in PEIA. And that includes now recently laws that include members or employees of charter schools. So that's just, this is how we get to the problem we're in right now with PEIA. We know the legislature is tackling it. And the question comes down to a very simple one. It's going to take money. Is it going to be money funded from the, by the state, or is it going to be money coming from public employees who are the insureds under the PEIA plan? Is it going to be a combination of both? But the question I have, and what I'm wrestling with, is how, to what extent can the legislature go to the well here with public employees and demand higher premiums, raise their deductibles, raise their out-of-pocket maximum amounts, given that we have a shortage of state employees in West Virginia. Jailers, teachers, people who work for DHHR, we know we're hurting to find people to work those jobs. Can the state reasonably go to PEIA insureds and ask for a greater contribution under these circumstances? The governor is going to kick $100 million into the pot there to try to delay the insolvency of PEIA. That's not the long-term fix, but that is the short-term stopgap for now. Larry Schultz, you're up first with the response. Um, I, I would be interested to know what those comparative numbers are uh, as a resident of the Eastern Panhandle for our Virginia friends, for our Maryland friends, for our Pennsylvania friends, the three states to which we lose so many of our good public employees because the pay is better. And, it, you know, if if it's tagged to the um, income of the uh, state employees and it's only going up an average of 1% a year, what's that saying about our pay scales, which are out of tune with other states? And so... In a in a um, situation where we're constantly told 
that the free market is the best way to resolve these problems, we're not competitive. And that's a real problem. You can get somebody to take this uh, job, but can you get the best people and keep them? That ought to be the question. Obviously, this is a narrower question that bleeds into that bigger one, and I don't know exactly how you fix it. I don't think that our PEIA is that far out of line with this similar program in Maryland or in Virginia. It's just that those states um, have better resources to fulfill it with, and they're more committed to making sure they keep these good teachers and good uh, police officers and good child welfare workers uh, in our state. Mr. Enders. Okay, um, I heard the numbers, what, 230 to 260,000 uh, people were insured by PEIA. Is that correct? Joe? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so what you're saying is that the government is the largest, if not one of the largest employers in the entire state, correct? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to approach this from a little different angle. I, I think that the government is just too big. You know, I hate to say that, and people were like, their minds will blow. But I mean, how do you have a state uh, with the number of residents we have and have 250,000 people working for the government? The government's trying to do too much. The whole problem is we could provide better insurance if the government didn't go out and try to buy votes, like politicians then go out and buy votes and create all these programs that then you have to staff up. It's really that simple. Well, a lot of those folks are teachers and school service personnel. They're all counted in as state employees in West Virginia. Right, right. I, I understand that. But at the same time, and you look at those numbers, that's, that's pretty, I mean, if you look at any other state, you know, probably Mississippi, maybe Alabama, but you don't have the government being the largest employer in the state. I don't know about that, uh, and that, but Chris is raising a good point. That I would like to see a comparison of government employees in West Virginia compared to other states. So, but he may be right, but I, I'd be a little surprised. We're, but, but what surprised me with the uh, uh, with the governor's speech, and I, uh, you mentioned hundred million dollars. I thought it was about forty five million dollars that he was doing. That was a hundred. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but there was no real serious talk about looking at fixing the problem, other than adding more money to it and uh, there was some reference about the uh the spouse being going to the third party insurance but that was the only real uh, real fix uh this like like dhhr uh you've got to look at the core of the problem we cannot continue just adding more and more and more money uh there may be some uh some serious review of the of how to structurally fix a problem we had the same difficulty three or four years ago and no real corrections were made they just added more money to it and kicked the can down the road i hope we don't do that this time alonzo the i think that we need to pay attention to more of of what this program is covering and what this is i think uh you hit the nail on the head what this is is a bailout they're sitting there and they're saying that there's not enough to uh run the program effectively with the pool of funds already being used, and so now they're going to have to bail it out. Now, uh, the problem with this is that we need to examine what does this cover? Is this a health care program? Is this a benefits program? And if so, maybe it needs to stop covering a certain amount of things that are uh, expensive in this health care world. I mean, you know, the price of these actual goods are expensive, and nobody ever looks at the prices of what it costs to support all of it. And then they sit there and they do what Chris says, you know, they uh, create these government programs that create all these benefits that they keep adding on because it's politically expedient and they never look at, to see if there's a uh, uh, any scarcity or, or what it costs to actually afford it. So. PEIA, it needs a, a, a complete revamp. I don't, I don't see that this is something that we can save by just throwing more money at it and hoping that it solves itself. Um, I, I think that this is an, an issue that needs to come to uh, either a private solution where they completely uh, change the actual uh, employer of this insurance or they decide what the identity of this program they want to be. Is this a benefits program or is this a health care program? Okay, the one thing I was going to jump in, what people don't understand is when you say justice is giving, you know, another $100 million to the program, that's not justice's money, and that's not West Virginia's money. That's the taxpayer's money. So every dime that you put into this program comes 
out of the pockets of the citizens of West Virginia and the residents here. And we're taxed at about 40% gross, you know, of our gross income. If you add up your cell phone taxes, all your permits, all your fees, everything else. I mean, our founding fathers would be rolling over in the grave to think that, you know, people today would accept 40% of your income going to government which I've said many times on the show before, is more than what you pay for your housing, your clothing, and your food combined in a year. It's ridiculous. Back to you, Joe. Well, the dilemma is that we actually need to hire more workers in some aspects of this PEIA program. We need more teachers. We're short 1,500 certified teachers. We need more people for our prison system. We need more people in DHHR because of the, the, the needs there. Uh, that our, our communities demand. Uh, so uh, I, I think the problem is only going to get worse. As I look at the actuarial study that's out projecting out to 2027, we're looking at a half billion dollars in the red if nothing is done to reform this program. And I think the states and, and the legislature is in a, a bit of a pickle here because they have to make this run more like a regular health insurance company where your your physical status, your health status, is taken into account in terms of setting your premiums. And your spouse has to certify that he or she does not have coverage through other employment in order to participate as a spouse of a state worker with PEIA. Those sorts of things have to be looked at. It's going to be hard to make those decisions given the shortfall we have in the arenas of, of – uh, you know, the schools and, and the uh, the jail system in our state, but it's going to have to be done in order to make this program viable going forward. You know, there's a couple other issues with PEIA that are also sort of captive of what's going on economically and as a labor force participation rate in the state, too, and that is the state is down a significant number of teachers and personnel. So those are people who otherwise would be paying premiums into PEIA and are not. Now, you might say, well, they'd be taking claims out, too. But the positions that we're, we're missing right now tend to be starting teacher positions. Those are young people who tend not to use their medical benefits as often. So these are the people that really you need in there to make up for those who are older and are making their claims, right, and taking the money back out. Uh, while they're still paying premiums. And the state is down a significant number of employees in that uh, under that scenario. So you have so many less premium payers that are involved right now who typically wouldn't take out the medical benefits as well. So that's an issue. And, and that's one that's much more difficult to correct on a larger level because that's going on around the country in almost every industry uh, right now. So, so that's a big problem that there's really no solution to that right now that anybody can offer up. The next part of that is, PEIA, as a legacy system, was really there because the state didn't pay well. And the deal was to the teachers, we're not going to charge you a lot for your medical benefits because we don't pay you a lot. So hopefully you won't leave for another state to make more money because your medical premiums are so low. But there's an 80-20 split that's supposed to take place where the state pays 80% of the premium and then the employee pays 20 and from what we're told by the legislators, including yesterday's conversations with Eric and, and Craig, that that hasn't happened in a while. The state's been eating up that difference so that the teachers don't have to kick in an additional, and, and school service employees and such don't have to kick in the additional premium money. There's that. There's, that's part of the issue as well. So there's a lot going on here. And as you mentioned, Joe, the premiums are charged based on how much you make and not what the risk associated with the employee is. So even structurally from that standpoint, there's going to be issues that eventually come around long term too, but the and, and Rob, go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Rob. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but and let me say, uh, people may be sitting out there in the audience saying, "Well, you know, I, I work for private business, and how does this impact me?" This the Chamber of Commerce makes this point, and it's very valid. When PEIA, when you have 230,000 people utilizing that coverage in the state of West Virginia at West Virginia medical clinics and hospitals, and those clinics and hospitals are being reimbursed at the rate of 60% of their actual cost for medical services, who bears the brunt of that? It's the guy who shows up at a clinic and is a self-payer and doesn't have insurance. He, you know, the, the, the clinic's trying to make up the difference there from what PEIA didn't pay them, 
and they charge a private payer or they charge somebody with private health insurance more because they're trying to balance their books. So the PEIA problem impacts us all in West Virginia, whether you're insured or not. As long as you're utilizing health services, this is an issue that should be on your radar as well. Larry? And we've got uh, some overwhelming um, societal problems in this state where we still lead the nation in opioid overdose deaths. (laughs) And so... You know, until we come up with solutions to those kind of problems, um, I don't mind saying, even though this is a TV show and you can see me, we lead the nation in obesity, too. Uh, uh, You know, it is what it is, and we are where we are. As we make these changes, we better be careful that we don't make the how we're going to get teachers problem, how we're going to get child care workers problem worse um that you know it's already bad enough as it is there are people who can see what it costs them in hancock maryland if they're teaching in berkeley springs for the health insurance and they're moving anyway <laughs> but five, that, that don't scare them yeah five six years uh, years ago uh we had pei crisis same as what we're saying today the solution that time was throw enough money into it to keep it viable functional for a few years i hope that's not the only solution they do this time i hope they look at some structural changes as well as infusion of money and bill while you have the mic a reminder when we come back after the nine o'clock break here you're on the clock sir you'll be up next our friday panelists today in studio alonzo perry making his debut alonzo how's it going so far i'm doing great i feel good no. Awesome. You look Happy good, to too. Here. I appreciate it. I try to be pretty sometimes. <laughs> looking good. Looking good. Chris Anders. Hey, how are you? The Always Admiral. love being here. Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. Larry Schultz. Great to be here. And via telephone, Joe Joey Torts for Ready. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Stubblefield, you are on the clock. Yeah, uh, just to sh- uh, show or demonstrate that I'll listen to your introductions, Rob. I Thank was, you. I was going to have raise the issue of the impact of the classified documents of President Biden. But because of your introduction, I'm going to shift. I'm going to talk about what what we enjoy doing this time of year, speculating what's what's going to happen in 2024. Well, you just as, made Larry Schultz very happy. Yeah, <laughs> as far as the yeah, I know. As he far, left the issue for me. Yeah, left. Okay, uh, but for the uh, uh, for the, the upcoming election, uh, it seems that the governor's race and the Senate's race are becoming populated very very early, uh, and the governor certainly more Capito, Mike Warner. Chris Miller, probably J.B. Mikulski. Uh On the Senate side, we have um, um, uh, Mooney. Uh, and then there's th- three people that that are have not yet declared, but I think going to play major roles in uh, 2024. One is going to be Governor Justice. Uh, he speculated that uh, uh, that he might run for Senate in his State of the State speech. Uh, the next day on one of the statewide talk shows, he uh, went a step farther and said he could see he would enjoy running against Congressman Mooney for the Senate. Uh, we have, um, uh, so we don't really know where justice is going to go. Marcy has the option of going either the governor's race or the, uh, or, or the Senate race. Uh, as does Senator uh, Joe Manchin. Uh, I suspect Senator Manchin will be running for re-election, whether it's going to be re-election as a Senate or re-election of the governor, I don't know. Uh, and the, conceivably, the uh, direction that Joe Manchin goes will impact the way that, uh, that uh, Patrick Morrissey goes. So there's a lot of dominoes right now, and it's a very fascinating time for me and others that kind of speculate on what domino is going to fall and how others are going to respond. So my question for the assembled group is projecting ahead for the, uh, for the run for the governor and the Senate, besides the ones that's declared, how will Joe Manchin, Patrick Marcy, and Justice, uh, uh, which, which course of action they'll take? All right, let's start with you, Torts. Well, I, I'm guessing, uh, and I, I think this will be disappointing to him personally, but I think Patrick Morrissey is going to run for governor. Uh, I I think the announcement by Moody and the uh, leanings of the governor have uh, forced uh, 
I think the attorney general's hand on that. So I think he'll be running for governor. I expect justice to jump in. Uh, he mentioned working out of Washington in the state of the state speech. And then in a recent interview, uh, I think yesterday, indicated that he is strongly considering running for U.S. Senate. Uh, and he said he relishes the thought of going up against Mooney. So because there's no love loss between those two. So I think that's going to shape up to be a Justice Mooney race. And I think Manchin will join the fight for U.S. Senate uh, eventually. Uh, the governor saying that uh, he respects Joe Manchin. He can still considers him a friend. But in his words, Joe has strayed off the reservation a little bit here recently. And so he's worthy of a challenge. And so I, I think that's in the two most important races coming up in the next election. I think that's how it's going to shape up. Alonzo. You know, I really I can't see Governor Justice uh, jumping into this federal race. I think that um, uh, I don't think it's controversial to say that his health won't permit it. You know, and I think that there's a lot of um, walking when you're at the Capitol. There's, you know, a lot of stairs at that building. And I think that his health just will not permit him to be able to um, have a continual race. Uh, as for uh, Patrick Morsi, I would love to see Patrick Morsi get into the governor's race. I think that there's uh, a lot of room to, you know, select a strong conservative in that position. And with that, you know, landmark case, West Virginia versus EPA, I think that, you know, he's got some steam that he can possibly, you know, run into that section. As for uh, Manchin, I think there's no love loss with Manchin here in the state. I think a lot of people like him, but uh, I, I don't see him winning any race that he jumps into. I think that uh, people have seen the partisan votes that he's had recently and uh, just some of the bills that he supported, like the Inflation Act that, you know, was totally mischaracterize what it actually did. Um, and I think that they're just, they're, they're tired of it. And they realize that the mothership of the Democratic Party does not care about West Virginia, and there's nothing he can do to save that. Mr. Schultz? Um, I, it would, I tend to agree with Alonzo that Jim Justice, regardless of what he might say, may not be able to run uh, for Senate just because that is a daunting task. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, by riding in a car from the Greenbrier to uh, Charleston every day, he's gotten used to a lot of miles uh, as, a, as a car passenger, which, you know, you're going to spend some time in a car if you're, if you're campaigning across this state. Um, I really don't see that. I also don't see uh, Patrick Morrissey, whichever race he decides to pick. Uh, coming out successful. I just don't. I think people have had their opportunity to vote, and they voted him in as attorney general a couple of times, and that's going to be enough. Um, so, Is that a uh, gut feeling? Or you, it, it's just a gut feeling. I, you know, you got to guess about what the people of West Virginia will do, but I don't think Patrick Morrissey will make it no matter which way he chooses to go. Um, I do believe... And for this reason, I would root for Jim Justice to do this, that um, Jim Justice will beat Alex Mooney straight up in, in a uh, primary, um, simply because the, the difference between those two people is all about how much they know about and are in touch with people all over this state. And whatever we say about Jim Justice, everybody knows him. He's in touch with everybody, and he's got his uh, feelers out uh, every which way. So, uh, you know, there's a part of me that hopes he does run, uh, despite the fact that it could be kind of a risk to him, um, because I, I don't think I want Alex Mooney to be the senator from my state. I mean, what do you think that Jim Justice would have to offer to West Virginia from that position in the Senate? Like, I know... Alex Mooney's running on bringing back the gold standard, which is actually going to, you know, uh, s secure our currency, which I think is, you know, it's not only a, a future representation of, of bringing, you know, uh, hope towards not only the state, but to the country in general. I think that, you know, there's a, a bright light that's with Alex Mooney's campaign. And uh, I'd love to see, you know, that challenge. But I, I don't see justice, you know, creating that same vision. Um, I, I don't think he's been able to fight here. I, I don't know that to the electorate of the whole state, 
that a vision like you're talking about, which I think is an important thing to have, is necessarily in the top 10 well, of, of things that set candidates apart. Well, what I'm hoping, and you know, if you're gonna ask me what the overinflated egos of politicians will drive them to do in 24, I don't really know. <laughs> but I will say this, too often in politics, we get stuck in uh, personality politics, we get stuck in 30 second sound bites. When your future is controlled by who is being elected, people need to stop letting them get away with things like, you know, holding up their dog for PR points or whatever they're doing. They need to focus on real policies, real policies like hyperinflation created by the Federal Reserve, real policies like the fact that we're so far in debt, we, we mean at this point, it's almost like the number doesn't matter. Real policies like your life's so regulated, you can't decide what light bulb you want to have in your house. But even bigger than that, too many people get sucked into the federal elections okay there's very little that can be done in federal politics very little trust me I've worked in politics for 15 years when people run for federal office it's not so much they want to get something done when they run for state office that's where you can get things done and that's where people should and voters should pay the most amount of attention in the 24 cycle is the state offices because those people directly impact your life so you're essentially lecturing Bill to never introduce this subject again. <laughs> if I, if no. I read between the lines here, no, I would never. I would never lecture Bill. <laughs> yeah. I'm just taking yeah. my interpretation from it, Bill. I'm not sure I agree with Chris on a lot of things. But I, but I, <laughs> well, no, you're not sure about on that one. But I, but I, I do, pretty sure. I, I, I do agree. The closer you get to the people, the more impact you have, and that would be both state office and the and the local offices. Correct. As well. But a couple points that was made, I. Think I think that uh, that uh, uh, Mansion will take his lead from Justice. I think Justice is one of the few people that could probably beat Mansion the state. Uh, of course, others will disagree with me, but Justice is extremely popular. And so I think if Justice decides to run for the Senate, I think you may well see Mansion running for the governor. Don't know. The other thing about the Inflation Act. Uh, uh, there was a lot of heartburn with that when it came in because it was pushed by the Democrats. If it had been pushed by the Republicans, it would have been embraced in West Virginia because it's the, the name is a misnomer. Granted, the name is bad, but it's bringing a lot of dollars, infrastructure dollars, into the state. And give it a couple of a couple of years, these dollars are going to bear fruition. And I cannot imagine Joe Manchin running, running away from that. He's going to embrace what was done and the impact it's had. So. You looked at the statewide electability of Jim Justice versus Alex Mooney. And I think a lot of people underestimate Alex Mooney in elections. Uh, Almost every time. This is a guy who knows how to win an election. Yeah. I think he's only lost one of them in his, uh, in his career. Uh, and he came into West Virginia, and honestly, I gave him zero chance of moving into West Virginia, running an election, and winning it for a congressional district as big as the district he had to run in. What would it go from here to Charleston, uh, basically? Yet he did. And people, well, because there was a plurality of candidates, he only needed to get this percentage point. But the rest of them played by those rules, too. Yeah. But Alex Mooney knows how to run and win an election. And I would not estimate him, despite Jim Justice's popularity, I would not underestimate him in that, in that race. Uh, we move on to issue number three. And for that, we go to Alonzo Perry. Oh, what, what issue I'm supposed to bring up into him? Yes. Um, well, you know, I actually want to talk about this uh, county council ordinance i think yes. that that was um something that uh was really interesting because the county council had basically organized a public nuisance order that was going to essentially allow them to um create a a department to investigate whether there was a lot of trash or um some of those aspects of it but um after a bunch of public outcry, and I think uh, uh, many groups in the area, they started to kind of petition against it and stand out, you know, uh, in opposition because of how it was written. You know, the county council just dropped it. And I think that that was an interesting phenomenon. I just wanted to, you know, get everyone's ideas on what do they think um, motivated that and uh, if they were able to read the ordinance and see what were the things that 
Can you can you sum up the ordinance so everybody knows what we're talking about, Alonzo? Do you have anything handy? So let me see if I can find a, a quick characterization. Well, Chris, of it. if you have it, I mean, I got an email last night from the uh, West Virginia Constitutional Conservatives. I guess they're a new pack here in uh, West Virginia, and they put out. It's basically a government backed by the force of law HOA. And what they were going to do, and personally, first of all, in my opinion, whoever came up with this idea should be rode out of politics on a rail. Because they're going to come in and they give people the power to come onto your property, right, through the ordinance, not through a search warrant as required by the Fourth Amendment, right? And if they see something wrong that they don't like, odor, noise, vegetation, you name it, then they will find you. If you don't fix it, your only chance to uh, appeal it is to go back to the fox who's in charge of the hen house, which is the county council. So they made it a civil action where you go back to the county council and go, hold on a minute here, you know, I didn't do this, but that's not how the rule of law works. It's very clear in the Fifth and Sixth Amendments of the United States Constitution, you have your day in court in front of a judge before you're deprived of your life, liberty, or property. So they were creating essentially this government backed by force, which means guns, you know, HOA, that they want. I, I think in the end, they want to try to make Berkeley County more like, you know, Northern Virginia, and they want to attract those people. And it might be a back door to try to get zoning in. But thankfully, all they did was table it. They didn't kill it. They didn't say, we're not going to do this. So they could bring it back up at any time. And anybody who believes in the oath of office that the county council took or the Constitution in general, I mean, it violates your constitutional rights. It violates one of the key principles of a free society, which is private property. And um, they should be held accountable for this and made to pay for even thinking something like this up. Alonzo, anything to add to that or differ from what Chris just explained? Uh, no, it's it's an ordinance that says it establishes rules, regulations, and standards governing the abatement of public nuisances, remediation of unsafe structures, and control of litter. And some of the provisions went beyond that actual uh, definition that they had threw out there and some of the, um, uh, I guess, principles and, and policies in the actual structure of the bill. So, and so what I'm wondering is, you know, if county council is going to continue to pursue the public nuisance order or if this is, um, you know, a, a, a symptom of something that they're saying, hey, we're not going to we're no longer going to. It, it, was your issue that they were going to go in excess of what you read in their written description? Or was, you, or, or was your issue the entire concept of bringing that up? So I think that the concept, um, when I was listening to Sheriff Harmon speak about it at a town hall, he had said that this was to mitigate the drug problem. And I think that um, he said, essentially, you know, there are places and structures where there's crime, there's, you know, uh, violence and different things going on. And they want to be able to have this order so that they're able to, you know, uh, almost uh, add their prejudice into law saying oh because these people are doing this action right here you know we should have a ex expedited way to entry and yeah. uh structures and okay. yeah, yeah, that, that's the problem that's the one thing i didn't mention is they kept bringing it up you know this is to whenever government wants to take more of your freedom away they wrap it around several things children drugs or terrorists okay and they take away your rights and what this is in, in there in the nuisance part they listed drugs you know they want to be able to go in you know, apparently without a search warrant. I'm sorry, that's not how a, a constitutional republic works. That's not how your 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 right God given rights enshrined in the Constitution work. If you want to go in, you have to show probable cause in front of a judge, get a warrant, and then enter the property. And it has to state exactly what's being searched and and who. So you know, when it comes down to it, this was a total attempt. You know, a lot of times you hear people say, well, I'm a conservative and I believe in this and they're tramping their, you know, they love the Second Amendment, but they forget about the first, you know, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. I mean, you have to be consistent in this. All right, hang on. I just got a text from Sheriff Harmon. Talk about instant input here. It says, we received the input we were looking for about the ordinance. We need to address the citizens' concerns. This will not, capital not, be an ordinance without our citizens' agreeance. It needs cleaned up and separated into three separate ordinances, and we then need to have town halls to again gather citizens' input. I'm inviting uh, Sheriff Harmon on the program next week. We'll work out a date. Now, I just happen to have in studio with me a former county commission president and 
via telephone, an attorney, and in studio, an attorney. So we can get into this, the, the nitty-gritty, get down and dirty with this, Billy. Yeah, yeah, before we have the citizens marching in with flag, uh, with burning torches trying to put the uh, towards the county commission i did a little bit of research on this i was not aware of the problem and the way i understand is that the initial ordinance was uh, uh was very targeted there was uh, there have been instances where been able to avoid uh through loopholes avoid the abc agency alcohol beverage control they've been able to do it so the original ordinance was designed to close a loophole during the various rewrites of uh uh and had various uh, various groups to look at it it did become it was expanded the county council uh yesterday looked at the rewrites and realized it was far beyond what they had intended and they were they were concerned it was an overreach so i do not think they have no intention of passing this because of an overreach so regardless chris just calm down a little bit it was not an effort to uh, uh, start uh, introduce anarchy in fact i thought it was done exceptionally well by the county council they had a they had an, uh, a a need they were going to address as it was going through the process they decided it was way way in excess what they wanted so it's i don't think you'll pass sheriff Harmon says mr stubblefield is exactly correct and by the way on our <laughs> facebook page staunch democrat brad Knoll says i never thought i would agree with anders <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean but that was, not, that was not going to happen though i mean that, there, that's, there was, that's speculation i mean wh wh what they did is they faced pushback so they're going to try to go back and change it but we have to be careful that whatever they come out with, whatever it is, is within the rule of law. All right, Larry Schultz. Uh, it, it just seems to me that uh, I, I don't fully understand this, but there seems to be an equivalence being made between drug dealers and trashy yards. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and, and you know, as a guy who lives, thankfully, in another county, uh, <laughs> I have two very messy garages. And I could see how if I left the door up on the wrong windy day... All of a sudden, I'm a drug dealer. A yeah, SWAT I, team kicking yeah, in your door. That, that <laughs> seems like a little bit of a but, a but, but give the county council credit for realizing yes. where it was going and Agreed. it was an overreach, and they backed off very quickly. I, uh, I, I don't think they deserve the credit. I think the problem, the, the people that deserve the credit, are the citizens who stood up. I, if they wouldn't have faced a public backlash, they'd have continued on. Joe no, Ferretti, I, I disagree with. Let me go to Joe Ferretti here real quick. Well, uh, let, let me. Pause at this, though. As a downtown business owner, I welcome the fact that the city of Martinsburg has a dilapidated buildings uh, ordinance and, and an inspection crew that goes around because I've had many incentives to move my business out of the city limits. Number one, because of B&O taxes. But number two, I had a dilapidated building right next to my office space. And trust me, I spent money with uh, inspectors coming in, with uh, exterminators, and, and having to deal with drug deals going on next to my business in downtown Martinsburg because it was an unoccupied, dilapidated house. The city eventually took action against the out-of-state landlord and forced him to fix it up and rent it out or tear it down. That was the option given. And after years of chasing this out-of-state landlord, there was a remedy uh, that, to, the, to the point where I felt safe sitting in my office knowing that I wasn't going to have vermin running around trying to, when I'm entertaining clients. So I, you know, there is a role here for government to play. I agree. Maybe the, the county, and I didn't study the county ordinance, what was proposed, and the overreach concerns. I didn't study that all that closely to comment. But I have to say that when we're talking about nuisance, remember, there are people who live next to these properties who have to endure a nuisance and should, shouldn't have to do that. And they shouldn't have to resort on their own to the court systems to get a remedy uh, all the time because that's expensive. Uh, so I, I, there's another voice that needs to be heard in this debate, and I hope folks understand that there's a balancing act that has to take place. I don't think people are going to show up with guns to fix you to force your property or fix your property up. But I do think 
that government has a role here to ensure the tranquility and, and safety of all of us who live in this county. Mr. Andrews, you have a hand up. You disagree? I, I disagree. I mean, we have a court system, whereas people can petition the court to have things done. We don't need the government going in. I mean, it, it's just absolutely ridiculous. It is like, you know, it's almost like a just a smidge of socialism. It really is to say, you know, we're going to get the government to go in and do this. I mean, if, if my next door neighbor decided to create a mess, first I go over and talk to them, right, and say, hey, you know, why, why are you doing this? And that, that didn't work. You know, I might pursue things in, in a court of law. But at the same time, I don't expect government to come in and try to, you know, it, it essentially was like an HOA. You know, I mean, we're going to go in and make sure everybody's behaving themselves, make sure, you know, everything's clean. And, and, and it just, I don't. It, the problem I had with it was a violation of constitutional rights, where you, you had no recourse of law, you had no due process of law, and you had no privacy under the Fourth Amendment. Alonzo. Anything that unreasonably annoys was enough of a justification <laughs> to right. take properties. Things that violate community moral standards. And this is the language that was used. I mean, you take that anywhere, and I mean, you... You could say anything could cause, you know, something that, that is against your moral standards. You know, if you didn't like a Trump flag at your next door neighbor's house, you know, you could call the commission to, to launch an investigation. And it just provided a, a, a blank slate to just, you know, uh, enter domains without having to get a warrant. It, it you know, gave the, the notion and the power that usually is prescribed to the courts to uh, – uh, a bureaucratic agent that they appoint. It and sounds like the same objections used with red flag laws, uh, too, yes. by the way. Bingo. Yeah. Billy? Bingo. I was going to say, they're, they're the same. do we not give credit to the county council realizing it was an overreach? Oh, no. And, and, that, and what I want to know, because if we're hearing now that Sheriff Harmon is saying that this is coming back with uh, three different orders or whatever, is, you know, we have to be vigilant on the actual language of this bill, because that's what's important. It's not the idea. The idea is awesome. And here's, here's the... Uh, the thing I really want to get across is that there is way too much red tape with certain issues like fighting the drug problem in West Virginia. I've spoken ad nauseum about uh, some of the uh, programs like, um, what are they, the diversion programs that the state has taken on where law enforcement can't even, you know, pursue the person after someone has overdosed on a drug. So let's say you overdose on a narcotic, you know, they're not even able to arrive to the scene to question that individual to where they got it from. That's one person away from the person that sold them that narcotic. And not only that, but our EMS workers are unprotected, you know, at these scenes of people that have overdosed because when someone pops up off Narcan, you know, they could be violent, there could be different things that happen there, but you know, we have red tape at the state level. And what the county commission's doing, I understand that they're trying to address this problem, but that's not where we need to remove the red tape. You know, um, I think that this was an issue that could be civilly litigated. And I think that, you know, um, the way that they said this is overreach, I, I hope that they take careful consideration of how they address this problem. All right, Alonzo, you had the final word, unless somebody needs to chip in with something. Anybody? Going once, going twice. Issue number three is sold. Attorney at law Larry Schultz is up with issue number four, Lawrence. Yes, um, and I thank Bill Stubblefield for leaving this uh, opening. Um, will Republicans finally admit that the mishandling of classified documents is serious business? Um, like claiming you own them is serious business? And leaving them out where your guests can paw through them is serious business? Because for a long time, up until just a couple days ago, that was the tone I got from a lot of Republicans I spoke to about the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Now that they have found a way to blame it on Joe Biden, aren't they in kind of a, a, kind of a tough spot? Because don't they have to kind of say, well, this isn't really that big a deal. But they're not saying that. They're saying it's a very big deal. So which is it going to be? So the question is, big deal or not? I feel like Monty Hall here. Right. <laughs> well, let's let's address. Yeah, go ahead, Alonzo. Let's address that this is a false equivalency. You know, the 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 Biden documents that are being linked are nothing like uh, what they found with Trump. I mean, there were three separate three separate uh, places that they found documents from Biden. Uh, they actually have suppressed the story about it released in the media before the election cycle. And, you know, uh, none of this stuff 
is is equivalent to the witch hunt that was going after the documents in Mar-a-Lago. I think that there was a, a clear distinction between these two separate events, and uh, it just shows that when Biden's in his 60 Minutes interview saying, you know, uh, this is reprehensible, this is disgusting, how can you be so irresponsible? You know, that's a joke. It's a joke now. And it's, it's sad that, you know, um, we're saying that Republicans should say that this should be serious for both of them as opposed to just saying that, these are not the same events. This Can is I make an observation worse. real quick? In the past, we've had Larry Schultz throwing the red meat. Now, Larry's catching the red meat. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just make an observation number two. Unlike Mr. Risenweber or Mr. Height, so far Alonzo has resisted coming across the table <laughs> at Larry while he responds. Larry, Larry's getting, uh, Larry's getting uh, bouncing Larry's up, trying. ready to go. Larry's ready to go. Larry's trying, though. I think I invited the red meat. I seem to recall raising this issue I believe you did. when yeah. only Republicans were even thinking about it. And so I, I guess my point would be this. There is nothing uh, the same about these two cases because as soon as Joe Biden's people found out about this, they turned the documents over immediately. They didn't spend a year and a half fighting and, and ending up in court and having uh, search warrants issued. They immediately turned the documents over. Why? Because they have nothing to hide. He had Mr. It. Trump spent a year and a half or more um f fighting to say well these are my documents and and they were all a lot of them all the boxes had classified documents some of which said skiff only secure compartmented information facility you can't even have that kind of a document at a place like mar-a-lago because it's not a skiff so it, it, i think this you know, unlike a lot of democrats who i've talked to recently I think this is a good thing because now we get an opportunity to hear from our uh, Republican friends how important it is to keep secure control of this sort of stuff and not engage in a year and a half fight after people know you have them. You know, the one thing we don't know about Mr. Trump is what if any of those documents, once everybody found out he had them, did he sell? Donald Trump sells things. That's what he does. So, all right, so when attempt number know. one is to get Alonzo over the table failed, you're coming back harder. But number two, Alonzo, can you resist it, Alonzo? That's that's a conspiracy. See, I mean, you know, we're, we're we're sitting here and we're you know saying, oh, he may have done this. He may have done this. Let's let's talk about what's in actuality. Mar-a-Lago has a bunch of Secret Service agents, and he had the documents locked in his house as opposed to Joe Biden that has it locked in his workspace when he was a vice president. He's had this uh, uh, documents left over from 2017. So this is a false equivalency. Looking at the actual uh, uh, merits of where they found the information, uh, the, the classification and who was actually in protection of it, you know, there's a significant difference here. And right. I, Lair, hold on, because we're going to come back okay. to you at the end like we usually do. I want to get everybody else All in right. here, too. On the phone, Joe Peretti, attorney at law. Well, I, I don't want to get into the qualitative differences uh, about these transgressions. Uh, they're both transgressions, and politically, uh, this is not good for President Biden at all. Uh, I, I think that uh, now that if he shoes on the other foot, he's going to have to deal with this. And long term, we need to understand that the state has secrets, and they are to be kept secret. And the cavalier way, which we've seen now two presidents deal with classified information and probably more that we don't know about, uh, thinking back to other presidents, uh, we probably need to clean that up a little bit so that the National Archives uh, can get the information that they're required to get and the state secrets remain secret. Uh, I think we're discovering there's a major hole in the system here, but politically, this is damaging to the current administration. We don't know everything yet, so I think the rest of this is, is speculative as to what kind of documents there are and the circumstances surrounding this. Uh, clearly, the White House is going to clam up now because the special counsel has already been appointed, and, and so it becomes uh, an adversarial process. But much to learn there, but uh, politically, uh, it's just not good going forward. Politically, I think the uh, the president has been saying he's going to run for re-election. Uh, 
Uh, he's saying that more and more frequently. He's got to get this problem resolved for even consider running for reelection. Plus, it's going to open the door other for other candidates that may want to wade in. I think prior to this, the door had been closed for many other candidates. Now, I think the door is ajar and it may open fully. So, I um, uh, I like to see more candidates running, and I like to see younger blood uh, in on in the White House, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side. I appreciate that coming from a guy who refers to Joe Biden as that kid in the White House. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Take up for me, Joe. <laughs> Chris, Chris Anders. Well, I, apparently a lot of people have studied this a lot more than I have because, to be absolutely honest, I, I'm busy mostly doing things like trying to save the lives of the unborn, passing constitutional carry, and actual real policy. And when I look at this Enough thing, self-flagellation. Move on. <laughs> no, 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 no. But what, what I'm saying is, is that people... If this this is just indicative of personality and team sports politics. Okay, you have personality politics. Politics. You have team sports politics. You know, team R, team D. Um, you know, people. You know, they they will change their opinion based upon who did something. Just like you know, right now in Virginia, Republicans are pushing for a 15 week abortion ban. That essentially what that does is it legalizes 96 percent of abortions. So if a Democrat had voted for that, the Republicans would pummel them and say that's a bad thing. But Republicans are trying to get away with it. So we we get we get too balled up in in personality politics. And, and party politics and to really look to see, you know, what the real principles are. And, you know, like I said, I, I didn't pay much attention to this. I'm too busy wondering whenever something like this comes out in the news, what are they trying to hide from us? Larry comes back to you before, yeah. well, you know, do I need to go to Alonzo first? Oh, well, I mean, I, I just think that we have to pay attention in the uh, instances of smear campaigns. And that's what this is. This is, you know, uh, entertainment. This is media saying, you know, um, oh, look at what Trump did. I mean, they went and threw the documents all on the floor and staged it like it was a Tarantino film. And then now we're watching, you know, this happen to uh, Biden. And the coverage is so different. It's just it's it's. It's mind boggling that we can sit here and look at these two events and say, oh, these are the same things. Biden should be OK because of it. And the special counsel, you know, doesn't have to address anything as, you know, they have with the actual Trump uh, campaign. Lawrence? The, the differences between the two things will ultimately spell why, even though this isn't particularly good for Joe Biden, it will be bad for Donald Trump. And the differences are the sheer volume of documents at Mar-a-Lago and the intentional efforts by Trump to first haul them down there, knowing darn well that he couldn't have them, and then insist that they belong to him, that he wasn't going to do it to the point where they had to go get a warrant and search his house. Um, nobody's ever going to have to get a warrant to search Joe Biden's properties. As soon as he found out about it, boom, they were back. They gave them back to the National Archives. That's what the law requires when the National Archives calls you up and says, give us back our documents. You <laughs> give them back. And Donald Trump just didn't do that. And now that's, interestingly to me, going to be uh, in, in sharp relief. It'll be very obvious. As you compare these two Before cases. we move on to Chris for the final issue, perhaps a question we're ignoring here is, how is this even possible that you can take these documents out with you when you leave a secure room <laughs> to your house or your vacation home. Or in, in this one particular case, as President Biden said, they were in his garage by his Corvette, which he always <laughs> keeps his door locked because it's a Corvette. That's his security for yeah. secure documents here. Sure. How is it possible to walk out of a federal facility with these items and nobody knows? Let me speculate on that. Now, Larry mentioned the word skiff a while ago. If it's a skiff document, it is practically impossible to walk out with it. Mm -hmm. If it's not a skiff document, unfortunately in the government, you see classified documents not only on a daily basis and hourly basis, Cases every few minutes so you get overwhelmed everything is classified so you develop kind of a cavalier approach to it uh, my role I saw this all the time but I was nowhere close to what the 
president and the vice president were. So I'm not should not be making an excuse, but I'm giving a rationale because the doc, the documents they handle it more cavalier. Is show. your garage door locked, Bill? <laughs> My garage door is locked. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're starting to set yourself uh, up for an excuse. I, no, I've said, His vehicle I, costs more I, than a quarterback. Right. Yeah, that's right. I have I have my own little skiff there, Rob. <laughs> I think Bill's doing some PR in advance of a problem here. <laughs> Issue number five, Mr. Anders. Okay, well, I, I'm going to bring up, we talked about teachers and the PEIA before. Um, I'm going to bring up a point that, that we really need to address. West Virginia's education system is a debacle. It really is. If you look at the ranking of the scores, it just keeps dropping. Um, you know, with a Republican supermajority, and they're supposed to be conservative, and they're supposed to believe in the free market. And, you know, why did they tinker around with the Hope Scholarship and not just go full bore, total and complete school choice? Because that, because a competitive market would drive up teacher salaries, a competitive market, you know, would empower the parents to make decisions for their children, not just to be told by the government you're sending your kid there. If you look at like Florida, who as they're phasing this in, you know, their test scores have gone up since they've done so. Um, and, and also, then you stop all this fighting at school boards. If somebody wants to send their kid to a government school, because they're not public, they're government schools, is send them to a government school to learn about CRT or whatever, but the parent wants to, that's their choice. But if a parent doesn't want to, they should have the same options and the same amount of money to spend to send their child someplace else. We, it's not, you know, everybody fights over who controls the school system. The problem is the power exists. We need to start getting it back to where it belongs with the parents and the kids. Joe. All right, Joe Ferretti. Hi, I want to make sure I understand what Chris is advocating for. So he would open up all public schools to open enrollment each year. Is that, is that, you'd is you'd have mon- the money right? would follow the child. So if the parent want the homeschool, they could have the money for homeschool. If the parent wanted to send their child to a Christian school, they could. If they wanted to send their child to a Muslim school, they could. It was parental choice. So in other words, the oh, money okay. follows the child. Okay, so but you're, you're still going to have school districts, and you're still going to have uh, boundaries as far as that goes. I mean, you could, but I mean, in, in all honesty, I mean, if you wanted to send your child to a school an hour away, you'd send your child to an hour, you know, a school an hour away. I mean, that's your choice. In other words, let people decide. Give people the freedom to decide. All right. So, and, and then as far as transport, then it would be on the parent to transport that child an hour away. The parent to transport or to use some of the funds to, you know, that they are given, you know, with with like a voucher system uh, with, with their child to hire transportation. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the free market takes care of a lot. And, and that's what you need to do. We need to empower these parents because I'm, you know, after a veteran of the school board fights at Loudoun County, Right. That was a lot of fun. Um, unfortunately, ended up on national TV, which is something I hate. But the thing is, you you, I'm no idea. But the thing is, you know, you 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 have these people fighting over. Well, we want Republicans in charge or we want Democrats in charge. The problem is get, get rid of it. Let the people decide. Try liberty for once. Joe, back, finish your thought. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, the problem we have in West Virginia is, you know, that may work in the eastern panhandle as, as, a, as an idea. But in a vast majority of the state. There is only one choice for a school. There, there are not multiple choices that these parents could exercise. So the state has a mandate to make sure these public schools provide a thorough and efficient education for the students. Uh, because we're a rural state, by and large, and the choices are very, very limited in probably 45 of the 55 counties in West Virginia. So I don't know that you're ever going to get away from the requirement that the state fund these schools appropriately and make sure they're providing a quality education because of a lack of choice. Alonzo. A way to fix that, though, the thorough and efficient, um, the writing in the state constitution has been tied to the rec decision. And when you look at the rec decision, it's the reason why, you know, Eastern Panhandle teachers can't get um, – uh, locality pay or they can't you know uh, have competitive wages with other parts of the state the rec decision was a disaster it was judicial activism they took thorough and efficient to not mean thorough and efficient but rather a universal county uh, pay system a universal pay scale for teachers and that's been the baseline now uh, there's been different things to allow uh, certain 
areas to uh, you know fund their schools appropriately. But I mean, when you look at it, other parts like in McDowell County, their school looks like a castle, and you know the teachers live like Scarface. And then here, you know, we have our kids in huts, and uh, the teachers are struggling to make ends meet. So uh, you know, the whole notion that that we can't fund the student and not the system is irrelevant. I think that that would be the prime the the prime solution to be able to make conservatives in this state kind of fix this whole education debacle and take that rec decision out of our constitution is by doing what chris says i think that that would be the smartest direction General school choice larry schultz you get what you pay for we're not paying enough and we're getting terrible education there are plenty of states that don't have universal school choice that are doing an excellent job in their public schools educating their children the, the 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 google machine will be your friend on that regard you can look them up but what are they doing are they letting everybody send their kids or homeschool their kids and subsidize them? they aren't doing all that they're just running an excellent public um education system and here's the thing for the future of west virginia there is almost nothing more important than educate public education if we're not willing, if we think we can cheap it off by making it some, oh, go do your own thing uh, in a state with a level of, for example, foster care already that we have, we're making a terrible mistake. We don't need to put in some universal uh, free choice decision. We just need to do what the other states do that do this well. Minnesota, Wisconsin, they've got excellent public schools um you know it can be done it's being done right now bill stubblefield yeah uh arguments are compelling arguments are weakened when you use speculation such as uh, uh crt uh, something to fight against crt i have not heard from a credible source that crt has been taught in our schools in fact i've heard just the opposite it has not been taught uh but this uh chris's i think basic premise was will the supermajority and our legislators take action on this uh We'll find out in the next year uh, or two years with a supermajority. Will they readdress, revisit the school choice issue that received a lot of uh, visibility the last couple of so years? Uh, will they just basically run it through because they have supermajority? We'll see. Chris, you get uh, 30 seconds to put a bow on it and wrap it up. Well, when you hear the uh, word uh, good government school system, um, you know, if you compared what, you know, how students are doing worldwide, the United States had general has failed. The only answer is to allow parental choice. Try liberty for once rather than control. Try letting the people decide what's best for their own children.